everyone, and welcome to our service of devotions on Good Friday. I'm very aware that this is a very hard day, uh, and the service is quite challenging in its own right. And um, we've always had cold cross buns after the service in the tea room. So you are invited if you want to stay for a cup of tea and some refreshments in the tea room after fellowship together. Let us pray. Almighty Father, look with mercy on this your family, for which our Lord Jesus Christ was content to be betrayed and given up into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross. 
who is alive and glorified with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance, beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which they had not been told them, they shall see, and that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering, acquainted with infirmity, and as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and yet we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, 
and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured him out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. For the word of the Lord.
the Holy Spirit testifies to us, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds, he also adds. I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. For the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. Pilate had Jesus taken away and scourged, and after this the soldiers twisted some thorns into a crown and put it on his head and dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him and saying, 
Hail, King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. Pilate came outside again and said to them, Look, I am going to bring him out to you to let you see that I find no case. Jesus then came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said, Here is the man. When they saw him, the chief priests and the guards shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I can find no case against him. They answered him, saying, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard them say this, his fears increased. Re-entering the Praetorium, he said to Jesus, Where do you come from? But Jesus made no answer. Pilate then said to him, Are you refusing to speak to me? Surely you know that I have power to release you, and I have power to crucify you. Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me if it had not been given you from above. That is why the one who handed me over to you has the greater guilt. From that moment, Pilate was anxious to set him free. But the Jews shouted, If you set him free, you are no friend of Caesar's. Anyone who makes himself king is defying Caesar. Hearing these words, Pilate had Jesus brought out and seated himself on the chair of judgment at a place called the pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was Passover preparation day, about the sixth hour. Pilate said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Do you want me to crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king except Caesar. So in the end, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. They then took charge of Jesus, and carrying his own cross, he went out of the city to the place of the skull, or as it was called in Hebrew, Golgotha where they crucified him with two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate wrote out a notice and had it fixed at the cross. It ran, Jesus the Nazarene, King of the Jews. This notice was read by many of the Jews because the place where Jesus was crucified was not far from the city, and the writing was in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the Jewish priest said to Pilate, You should not write King of the Jews, but this man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered them, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had finished crucifying Jesus, they took his clothing and divided into four shares, one for each soldier. His undergarment was seamless, woven in one piece from neck to hem. So they said to one another, Instead of tearing it, let's throw dice to decide who is to have it. In this way, The words of the scripture were fulfilled. They shared out my clothing among them. They cast lots for my clothes. This is exactly what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother and his mother's sister, 
Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. Seeing his mother and the disciple he loved standing near her, Jesus said to his mother, Woman, this is your son. Then to the disciple he said, This is your mother. And from that moment, the disciple made a place for her in his home. After this, Jesus knew that everything had now been completed. And to fulfill the scripture perfectly, he said, I am thirsty. A jar full of vinegar stood there. So putting a sponge soaked in the vinegar on a hyssop sick, they held it up to his mouth. And Jesus had taken the vinegar, he said, It is accomplished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. It was preparation day, and to prevent the bodies remaining on the cross during the Sabbath, since the Sabbath was a day of special solemnity, the Jews asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken away. Consequently, the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with him, and then the other. When they came to Jesus, they found he was already dead. And so instead of breaking his legs, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a lance. And immediately there came out blood and water. This is the evidence of one who saw it, trustworthy evidence, and he knows he speaks the truth. And he gives it to you so that you may believe as well. Because all this happened to fill the words of Scripture. Not one bone of his will be broken. And again, in another place, Scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. Do you please sit down? It's hard to imagine a Good Friday service without the hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, by Isaac Watts. It is said that Charles Wesley admired this hymn so much that he said he would rather have written this one rather than all of his own put together. Even today, it features in many lists of favourite hymns. But what is it that makes it so special? The words themselves are very simple. Simple words, great poetry, rather like the Gospel of John, written in simple Greek, but conveying great truths in memorable language. And for the same reason, because, like John, Isaac Watts was an evangelist. Not in the sense that he wrote one of the Gospels, but in the sense of writing to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. Today's Gospel account of the crucifixion, like all of John's Gospel, was written to help the young church understand who Jesus was, to help them understand what was achieved on the cross and what this means for each Christian. Isaac Watts continued this tradition in his hymn, which was one of the first in the English language to use the word I and focus on personal religious experience. 
to look on the effect on each one of us as we look at the cross of Christ. Critics sometimes say that this hymn is too personal, focusing too narrowly on only one aspect of the cross. That is, our emotional reaction to the example of Christ. You'll find no mention here of the victory of the cross, they say. Nothing about the cross setting us free from our sins. Nothing about Jesus as our substitute, our representative, the sinless Son of God doing for us what we sinners couldn't do for ourselves. And yet Isaac Watts has covered all of this in a single word, wondrous. It seems a very odd choice of word, doesn't it? Jesus died a very bloody and excruciatingly painful death on the cross. So why does Isaac Watts describe it as wondrous? The very wrongness of this word draws our attention to the fact that it is a shorthand, a shorthand for all those achievements of the cross. It is only when we consider everything that happened there could we possibly see the cross as wondrous. It is only when we remember that there on the cross, God brought to fruition what he had begun in a stable in Bethlehem and had planned long before. Today's gospel reading stresses the fulfillment of scripture. It stresses the power of God and the acceptance by Jesus of his identity and purpose. Jesus hung on the cross, taking our sin on himself. Not a scapegoat, the innocent victim of a jealous God who demanded satisfaction, but God himself, who loved us so much that he was prepared to go through the agony of the cross for us. To heal the division between God and humans, God became human. To put an end to death, he died. The cross is nothing less than the meeting point between earth and heaven, between God and us. And this most certainly is wondrous. The hymn is personal in the best sense. It applies to each one of us. We can't contribute anything to our salvation, but we can and we must respond to God's love for us. His love for you and for me, portrayed so clearly on the cross. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. The Gospel of John was the result of one person's response to that love. So were the other Gospels and indeed all the books of the New Testament. We must be grateful to their writers for recording the story of the cross. And to all those other Christian writers like Isaac Watts who have responded to the love of Christ through the centuries by writing books, hymns, prayers, and poetry, which help us to focus on the events of the first Good Friday, who have helped us to survey 
the wondrous cross, who have helped us to understand some small part of what took place at the cross, who have helped us enough for us to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that through believing we might have life in his name. We are not all writers, but we all have gifts which God can use to spread the good news. What will we do in response to such amazing love? Let us pray for the Church, that all Christians throughout the world will experience God's peace and protection, persevere in faith, grow in unity, and give glory to God.
Almighty, ever-living God. Your Son, Jesus Christ, gathered a people to himself and sanctified them with his blood. Watch over your church throughout the world, that we may be firm in faith and proclaim your name to all people. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all who minister in the Lord's name. For Gregory, our bishop, and all bishops, priests, and deacons, and for all God's faithful people that, filled with grace, they may serve God faithfully. Almighty and everlasting God. Through your Spirit, the whole body of the Church is governed and sanctified. Hear our prayer for all who minister in your name, that with the gift of your grace, they may be firm in their vocations and serve you in holiness and truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for those preparing for baptism, that through the waters of rebirth, they will increase in faith and understanding and rejoice in being one with Jesus Christ. Almighty God, you continually renew your church in faith and number. Increase the faith and understanding of those to be reborn in the waters of baptism, that adopted as your children, they will rejoice to call you Father, with Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for the leaders of the world, for our governments, and all who serve in public office, that they may seek true peace and freedom for all. Most gracious God and Father, you reach out to every human heart and desire the good of all people. May your spirit of peace guide the hearts of those who govern, that justice will flourish, freedom be secured, and goodness sustained throughout the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for the Jewish people to whom God first spoke, 
that they may grow in his love and be faithful to his covenant. Lord God, you called Abraham our father in faith and promised to make his descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the shore. Hear us as we pray that the people your first called will come to rejoice in the fullness of your redemption. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Let us pray for those who do not believe in Christ. That the Spirit of God will guide them to salvation. Almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, give to those who do not know you, your Son, a sincere heart to seek him, and help us, your faithful people, to grow in love for one another, that we may witness to your love in the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for those who cry out in suffering, for the hungry and thirsty, the captive, the poor, the sick, and those who are close to death, that God will bring the whole of creation to its perfect fulfilment. Almighty and everlasting God, you comfort those who mourn and strengthen those who struggle. May all who cry to you come to know your love and mercy in their hour of need. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, your Son, Jesus Christ, submitted humbly to suffering and pain, and his prayer was heard. May all find comfort in his outstretched arms and find healing in his wounds. We ask this through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Behold the cross on which the Saviour of the world was nailed. Come, let us worship. In the symbol of the cross, we can see the magnitude of the human tragedy, the ravages of original sin, and the infinite love of God. Looking at the cross in prayer helps us to truly see it. Most Christians have crosses in their homes. Many wear a cross around their necks. Some of these are very beautiful, perhaps made of precious metal and embellished with jewels. The beauty of these devotional objects may emphasize the glory and the victory of our Lord's cross. But too often, representations of this central symbol of our faith are regarded primarily as decorative and its true message lost. Of course, it is fitting that Christians glorify the cross as a sign of Christ's resurrection and victory over sin and death. But we should remember each time we see a cross that the cross of Jesus' crucifixion was an emblem of physical anguish and personal defilement, not triumph, of debasement and humiliation, not glory, of degradation and shame, not beauty. It was a means of execution. What the Son of God endured for us was the depth of ugliness and humiliation. And we need to be reminded of the tremendous personal cost of love. This time now is an opportunity for us to express ourselves in gestures and prayers too deep for words.
we now enter into communion with him who is our saviour and our life. He who gave himself for all on the cross gives himself to each one of us individually. As we join in this communion together, we say the family prayer which Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Jesus is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, Happy are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive thee, but to the Savior, and I shall be
Let us pray. From the throne of grace, O God of mercy, just as at the hour your Son gave himself to death, so hear the devout prayer of your people. As he is lifted high upon the cross, draw into his exalted life all who are reborn in the blood and water flowing from his open side. Amen. Amen. Most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved the world, grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. 